Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Friday night of a live streaming of Breaking News, Impacted Family and Friends. My name is Anne Marie Matulis, and I have the honor of chairing the Impacted Family and Friends Division of the American Association of Suicidology. Our roundtable tonight wraps around safe messaging, effective storytelling, methodology. It's complicated. It's wicked complicated. Um, you know, sometime in your life, I'm sure you were involved in a, in a conversation with someone, maybe an argument, hopefully a conversation. Um, and in the midst of that conversation, the other person said, well, yeah, mm, but some things are better left unsaid. And that's often true. Actually, though, there, there are a whole bunch of people in my life today that probably believe that I clearly missed that guidance. Um, but what I didn't miss and the lesson that I didn't miss was that I, I personally know all too well how heavy the burden can be when there are too many things left unsaid. And that can create an emotional burden. So how do we find the middle ground? How do we determine what remains unsaid? versus the burden of that silence. More importantly tonight, who decides that? Is there science behind it? And how do we move forward? So tonight's platform is being brought to you by Spark Media, producers of Scattering CJ, the Kevin and Margaret Hines Foundation, who of course are behind Suicide, the Ripple Effect, the Kevin Hines story. The American Association of Suicidology's Impacted Family and Friends Division. Um, and A Voice at the Table, which was the, which still is, the home for the Impacted Family and Friends movement. So again, safe messaging, effective storytelling, methodology. It's wicked complicated. So let's begin. Maybe the reason that I got to live 15 years ago was the culmination of this moment right here. God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. You had a very significant spine injury, but you were completely intact neurologically. Kevin Hines went to the bridge, jumped over the guardrail, plummeted 200 feet, but survived. When we were in high school, he had that first major breakdown. Junior year, and it was like a switch flip. And then you started acting out publicly. I didn't see hope. I didn't see a future. We had this conversation in the hallway, and you said, hey, I found out what's wrong with me. I'm bipolar. I really have been fighting for the last 18 years with this disease. Mania, depression, psychosis, hallucinations, all that's still there. I just know how to cope with it and I know how to beat it. When you see a lot of mental illness, that's a clue that the culture is sick and that's got to change. So that hope is there. I just, I know I have to keep going, I have to keep moving forward. You were the first person to ever say, you know, Kevin, you should talk about this to, to make an impact on, on people's lives. There is more that we all can get. I've heard people say, well, hope is not an action plan. Well, it's a start. Talk to 10,000 Marines in two days. If you see someone in pain, please say something. It is about all of us coming together, utilizing the power of our voices. You're going to get the help you need. We've got a story to tell. Get the voices out there. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're all helping. We're all one part of a big team. We just need to realize it. Yeah. You know? I want to say thank you. You saved my life. Put your hand to your heart. He is one in a million. You've been my inspiration. Oh. <laughs> Today there are days I don't see it light at the end of the tunnel. I just know it's there. done good with your second chance.
I don't get it. I don't get why this had to happen. I think through this, we just have to find a new normal. So we just have to figure out for the three of us what that new normal is, what it looks like. This process has never gotten easier for me. I hate what I'm doing. You know, who else is sitting at their dining room table right now with their son? Hallie had asked somebody on Facebook to do it, and then it just exploded. Please send me any pictures and a description of his journey. Allie, here's CJ. I'm taking scuba diving. We're going to go to the Great Barrier Reef. We're going to do it right now. Woo! It would be hard not to be there, so I will truly use your pictures and words to experience his journey. We're here today at the Great Pyramid of Giza. Veterans Memorial Park in Moral Oklahoma. To scatter CJ's ashes. People are gathering their families together and incorporated into their travels where it's not just a blip on the radar, it's a planned event. Who does that? They fly among the Buddhas, find peace. CJ, your mom, and your dad, and your brother Connor love you very much. Thank you again from the bottom of my very broken mom heart for helping me give CJ one last amazing journey. Your kindness will never be forgotten. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Hi, CJ. Hi, hey, Mommy. Hi, hey, handsome. Yeah. Maybe one day your mom will find peace in realizing how many lives you've impacted in the most uplifting way. Uh, can I, I, I just need to take a breath. Yeah, yeah us too. Um, probably something um, that's emotional for me that, that I don't know that everyone would share about what just happened. But um, my, uh, my best friend is a CJ. My son and my daughter are CJ is named for her. And so sometimes it's as a mom with, um, you know, two older kids, like it's a little... I have to think about from 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 the how 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 these moms are 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 going on, and I'm grateful for the great storytelling from Sex Batter and CJ, and I'm grateful for the great storytelling um, uh, from the Heinz family who are with us tonight, um, and I am sorry for the events that have brought us here to talk about this. Um. I understand uh, that tonight uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the power of stories. And tonight we're going to talk a little bit about, um, I think, some conflicting messaging in our field about storytelling and how and how we navigate that um, with people of various kinds of lived experience. Um, I'm Dr. April Foreman. I'm on the executive board of the American Association of Suicidology. Uh, and also, uh, I'm just an advocate for the Impacted Friends and Family Movement, and I'm, and I'm glad to be here. I'm wondering, uh, Bart, if you will, I, I'm just going around the screen. Bart, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you, April. Uh, it was a very touching introduction to this topic. I, I think it's one of the things that's so important. I'm Dr. Bart Andrews from Behavioral Health Response and from AAS, by the way, before I blather on. Um, but I think it's important when parents share their story like this, um, it helps other parents not be alone, right? Uh, and I think that's probably one of the most, is, is one of the important things I take away from this process is that think of all of the, the parents out there that don't know how to communicate about what's happened and they don't receive the support that they need. Suicide makes people more alone. It's like one of its it's one of its effects, right? Is it it's it after it happens, it makes people feel even more alone than before. 
and this sort of thing helps bring people together. So I'm just grateful to have this conversation and glad to be here. And 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 it's it's what a joy to be with so many great people here today. Kevin, Margaret, Heinz, can you guys introduce yourselves? I know we saw you in that wonderful movie clip. Can you talk a little bit about why y'all are here? <laughs> well, uh, I live with a diagnosed mental illness. And because of that, uh, the symptoms from that diagnosis, I attempted to take my life in a way that is 98% fatal. Uh, in the last 84 years, only 39 people have survived that way. I get to be here every day, uh, and I'm so grateful to exist and share my story around the world as often as I can. And this is my better half uh, and, and the best part of me, my best friend, Margaret. And we, uh, we made the film Suicide the Ripple Effect to inspire people who were suicidal to find hope and to, to stay alive. And, and, and you know, since the release of that film, over 300 people have written to us or gotten in touch with us in some way, shape, or form and told us that by watching that film, it saved their life. And so we just want to find ways to share more media that has it with storytelling and the art and science of storytelling that has a transformative effect on someone's existence. We're actually at 411, just from the movie alone. Um, I've seen significant efficacy with sharing stories. Kevin's obviously in particular, because that's who I travel with, live with, and um, work with. And um, I, I didn't realize, I didn't realize how, how stories could actually save lives and help people heal um, until I saw it firsthand. Um, and so, you know, I joined, basically, I, I, I joined the effort in mental health and suicide prevention with Kevin about five and a half years ago in order to scale that effort. And so that's why it's important to us. And Haley, could you tell us something about yourself? Oh, you're on mute, ma'am. Thank you. I'm not used to this. Usually Ethan is fixing that, so I'll get used to that. It's not to have people. <laughs> I know. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, extremely honored to be here with Kevin and Margaret. They are sort of in the world of advocacy. This They are, you know, I watched the Ripple Effect recently and thought I have got to do more than I'm already doing because of the work they're doing. So um, I'm a mom. I am CJ's mom. And um, I'm here because I have to be that sharing CJ's story is not just um, incredibly important to me. Personally, it's giving me a purpose to keep going. Um, suicide, uh, Dr. Andrews just said it's the most, you know, it's very lonely. And I have for 10 years felt that um, even though I know and have met many people going through this, that it is a very isolative, very depressing, very sad place to be. Um, th those of us left behind are left to wonder every single day. So sharing CJ's story raises awareness. It makes sure that CJ is remembered. Um, my biggest fear as his mom is that he'll be forgotten and that he will only be remembered for that last act. And he was so much more than that. So sharing his story and um, being able to talk about him gives me a purpose and keeps him alive. And we too, um, maybe not quite on the level of the Heinz, but even one makes a difference. We've been contacted repeatedly through the Scattering CJ Facebook project and through the film for people that have reached out and said that they've literally stopped in their tracks and changed their mind um, because not only did they see CJ's story, but they saw the struggle of the families that are left behind. So uh, I do what I do because I, I can't bring him back. And all I can do is hope that we can prevent others from following in both his footsteps and um, for being a mom like me. So thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Um, Andrea, tell us a bit about yourself. I'm a filmmaker. I'm here because of Hallie and I'm here because of people like Kevin and Margaret who are brave and courageous individuals to bear themselves and show their vulnerabilities and allow people like us uh, as filmmakers into their lives. And it's not just access, but it's the trust, uh, being able to 
tell their stories and tell stories that we know are so deeply both devastating and personal. And so for me as a filmmaker, I always feel privileged. Um, I think uh, the gratification is not just the story that we craft or we, cre or we create, it's really the friendships and it's the people that otherwise we wouldn't meet. And it's the sense that maybe the filmmaking isn't just changing us individually as we make the films, but it's also changing the audiences that we share them with. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited um, to help to be here tonight to help us really talk about storytelling and suicide prevention. Um, and to, I think, hopefully talk about it in a really, what's the word I'm looking for? I, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that is deeply connected to the fact that when we are telling our own stories, that is, that is powerful as, for us, it's powerful for our audience. Mm -hmm. And we also, um, in suicidology have a field that has thought about the, the telling of stories about suicide so much. Um, and that there's really some conflicting thoughts and opinions about it. Um, so I'd like to do a couple things before we get started. Um, this is the second time today that I get to do a live stream quoting Thomas Joyner, but, but the first time I got to do it right after he spoke. So, so sorry, so, so sorry that, so sorry that I'm fangirling, but he, <laughs> yeah. he once said, and the American Association of Suicidology Listserv, what we now call the Joiner Preamble, right? Which is that intelligent, sincere, educated people can disagree about the causes and solutions to nuanced problems. We can do that respectfully. So we're gonna talk about storytelling tonight, knowing that people ha can have strong opinions and those opinions can be uh, very data informed and we can have different perspectives that we can come from. We've also got a fantastic audience in the chat tonight. So I'm seeing Jackie and Tracy and Josh and Tom, Jessica, who am I missing? I all, I have to say, <laughs> oh, uh, oh my goodness, Bill, uh, Joseph. Oh my goodness, Pada. Look at, wow, look at all these folks who are in the chat. Um, so I'm hoping in the chat as we go along, I'm going to be asking some questions and, and hopefully hopefully helping us have um, having a powerful conversation where we bring our whole souls to bear. Um, so I hope for those of us who are engaged that you're going to share your, your perspectives on this as well, because I think it would be hard not to have a perspective. So when we talk about um, storytelling in our field, I, it's always interesting to me that we that we don't tell more stories. Um, I I would say um, having been uh, raised in a very religious family growing up, the idea that that you would use stories to transform your character, to tell you what to do, to put meaning on your life, to help you understand and live with your life, that seems like a very second nature uh, sort of of way to think about things. But in fact, I don't see as much storytelling um, when when we're coming together as professionals and when it comes to suicide. And I'm seeing storytelling. I'm, 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 I, I've often joked with Bart and with a few other people that I only ever see like three stories in the news about suicide, and it's like three the three same stories swapping out a few characters each time. Tell me from your perspectives, and I'll help us move through. Ju jump in, um, or, or Bart will just talk over you. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> tell me, tell me a little bit about why you feel your story or the telling of stories has been powerful to you and to others. Mm -hmm. Hallie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, well, I, you know, I said a little bit of this when I was introducing myself. When you are lost or when you're left be with sort of the unknown, CJ took his life um, in front of us. And it was graphic and horrifying, sort of the worst nightmare that, you know, we got put into. Sharing our story has given me, and I keep using this word, a purpose. I have never been actively suicidal, but I have been for 10 years very aware of the fact that my pain, my grief, and the tremendous guilt I live with every single day will not go away until I'm gone. So it's been um, a struggle. 
every day of the last 10 years to to find something that's stronger than my will to give up. And so sharing it openly and and, and I am graphic. I'm one of the people who will who believe that you need to know my son's story, all of it, in order to understand why there are other options, why there are are other answers and and I won't candy coat it. I've lost friends and I've probably turned off a lot of people, but I still absolutely intrinsically believe that that talking is is better than the silence and that I wouldn't be functioning. I literally wouldn't be able to cope if I had to keep inside even 10% of what I feel. Um, so storytelling for me has been a really unexpected gift. Um, creating Scattering CJ, I, you know, was a one small, tiny request. I had no idea it would turn into what it's turned into. And forming a community of people who are were drawn to our story because they have, you know, they didn't feel that they had somewhere else to turn or someone else to talk to. Um, finding like-minded people that are willing to be there for others, to share their stories have have definitely made me personally feel less alone. And when someone says to you, I absolutely was writing a suicide note and had pulled all the pills together. And at three in the morning, for whatever reason, I stumbled upon this, the, your Facebook page and started reading the stories and the comments, you know, that's powerful. And if we didn't talk about it, if I didn't talk about it, then no good comes from it. You know, CJ's death is, is horrifying. And I would give up everything to not be here on this panel talking about my son in the past tense. Um, you know, I, I didn't plan to be an advocate. I don't want to be a spokesperson, but I was put into a situation that, you know, you had a choice. You can curl up and literally give up or I can try to prevent others. So storytelling for me has been both literally like a life source over 10 years. And it's helped introduce me to people that I would not have had the um, blessing of meeting and I am stronger and I'm, I feel more capable every day that I keep going. So I think storytelling is just so necessary. I mean, what if CJ just died and that was it and I get to look at my son in an urn and, and relive that moment every moment and every, you know, every day and, and not have something positive come from it, then, you know, his loss would, would be, it would just, I can't even imagine that's to think that there'd be nothing is, is profoundly sad to me. So I, I'm going to talk until I can't talk anymore. And like I said, some people don't like it and I, I can't candy coat it. It's not pretty, it's not attractive and it's, it's still very difficult after 10 years, but I will just keep talking. So I would love to hear more about your, your, your thoughts of some people not liking it. Mm -hmm. That's but, what I wanted to hear too. So I was, you, I was wondering, like, I, I think we're, we're talking about telling our stories and I think you're bringing up a really important reality that not everyone's going to experience our stories the same way. What happened, Haley? So, I mean, I get, we, we've gotten some really strong pushback and some really negative comments. Um, I think first and foremost, people, suicide seems to be that it's contagious. If you talk about it, it's somehow going to, you know, if people acknowledge it, they're going to maybe be, you know, cursed by it. Um, for us, it's, it's just a part of what we are. It's my reality now. And I've had people that just flat out said, you know, you're beating a dead horse, no pun intended. You know, this is CJ died. CJ's gone. Um, we get all kinds of the, you know, God doesn't give you more than you can handle and you just have to suck it up and take it. And, you know, um, the negativity has been far outweighed by the positive response we've had. And I think if that hadn't happened, that would be very difficult. If it was constant, you know, the, if the negative was more prevalent, I'm not sure I would have been able to find the strength to keep going, but losing friends or losing people in our circle um, because they're turned off by me sharing really what is as is, is obvious in my world is the air I breathe. I mean, we are a family of three now, not by choice. Our son made a decision that, you know, whether he took the easy way out, which is what some people told me, he's selfish, he was, 
you know, he was rude. I mean, I've never been mad at CJ a day in his, in, in my life since he's been gone. Um, suicide is just such a horrific, I've said this before, it's a beast. It, it takes your loved one and then you are left to cope in a way that you, you don't have the skills. No one teaches you how to do this. I mean, my son, my, you know, I had 20 years of him and then nothing. So I've lost people. People are negative. We still get comments, thankfully, not as often. But the power in knowing and believing literally with every fiber of my being that this is the right thing to do, that sharing our son and his story is is a stronger decision and a and braver decision than just not saying anything. So it will take the ugly. And like I said, I won't candy coat it. And I am an absolute strong proponent in being honest and open. And um, it is complicated. It's horribly complicated. It's one moment I'm feeling fine and the next minute I'm feeling guilt. And and people don't always wanna know what I'm thinking after 10 years. And sometimes, quite frankly, I have to gauge what people can accept or what they can handle when I talk about it. But the truth is that I'm not the person I was 10 years ago. I was not built to watch my son end his life with a gun. Um, I worry every day that I parent my remaining son, Connor. He's 27 and doing amazingly well, but I still worry every second of every day that, um, you know, I, I want to swear I effed up with CJ. So what am I missing with Connor? So life is not easy. And I'm, I'm willing to take the people who are angry and don't like what I have to say because those that do and those that respond well to it, um, that's worth it. I mean, personally, I watched the ripple effect just recently, like I said, and I was profoundly impacted by that. And I, I lived this and yet that still had an impact on me. So I can only imagine for people that haven't had this to see that that's maybe their only contact with it. It may be their only context. And, um, it's just, it's so important. And I'll, I'll take the good with the bad. I just want to to note in the in the comments, and I know we'll we'll get around the room, um, but um, we have Tracy Ozer. You can't use the terminology you're using because it's too graphic for others. I hate when I'm told that 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 this that what what I what I need to tell is something that it's too painful for others to bear witness to. Um, you know, we we talk about we have another Tracy Tracy Griffin who's saying that the, that talking about the multiple suicides uh, for generations in our family is what what she believes is stopping the suicides from happening in the future, um, and that it will become a comfortable topic if we share and we talk. I mean, maybe it's part of the reason we're uncomfortable is we just haven't said anything. Um, I, I people, April, how how is feeling? How is um, sorry. I was just wondering how is safe messaging, you know, with organizations like AAS and others, how is that, how does that come to be? And who's at the table uh, in terms of contributing? Yeah, are, are you about trying it? to bait Bart so he's going <laughs> he's, he's to go off? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, because, because, I, because I'm hoping we'll talk a little bit that we can absolutely talk about the sort of the real dilemmas about safe messaging because there's there's some real stuff about that uh that is that there's some really great things about messaging that we think makes a difference and also some real fears about messaging so like people believe that that messaging is power it's powerful and i'm reading here i i how many people are talking about my pain being too painful for others or feeling pleased? I think that's just so interesting for people telling their stories. I saw Kevin and Margaret nodding their heads a bunch, and I think they're also going to start to tell that safe messaging story, I bet. Huh, Kevin, Margaret? Oh, uh, it, it's, about, it's about effective messaging for us. Yeah. Effective, encompassing, safe, and responsible. And respectable. And, uh, and, and, messaging as well. And I think it, if it's done in an educational manner, without sensationalism, with the aspect of, for, for me personally, the, when I tell my story and I talk about the method of, of going over the Golden Gate Bridge, there's no getting around that. You know, that, 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 that's, that story is widely known. There's only a few survivors. I'm one of five that get to stand, walk, and run. You, you can't get around that part of the story because then I'd be lying to myself. And we're not CNN or Fox no, or MSNBC. No. These stories were publicized and made into a global story 
many years ago. Without my before, even, but yeah, yeah, before you know, people started to um, call themselves experts and uh, say we shouldn't be discussing methods. So I don't know. It's a little bit. It's, it's, it, if like, this is what I tell people because I hear get a lot of comments from folks saying, "Oh, can't see the Golden Gate Bridge. It's or a bridge. It's just too triggering." Well, that's great. I'm really sorry that that's triggering you. Don't look at it then. And then we get we get messages like, you know, um, you really shouldn't discuss method. It's just, you know, <laughs> although there's no science behind what they're saying, they're saying don't discuss method. It's just it's just not right. It's triggering, et cetera. Here's the thing: if they can find a way to get a net up on the Golden Gate Bridge and put barriers up on government infra and large infrastructures without discussing it to be a death a site of death, then let's talk. That's it. Otherwise, you're coming up with problems with no solutions. Right. And I, I had no intention of ever telling my story. I had no intention of speaking out upon what I had gone through. And here I was in the psych ward, my first psych ward of nine in the last 14 years, after, directly after my jump. I'm, I'm in a back brace. I'm walking with a cane. I had just, I had just been into healing physically for four and a half weeks uh, after a surgery. And I'm in the psych ward, and a Franciscan friar canes me and said, kid, when you get better, you want to tell your story. And I remember looking at this Franciscan friar and saying, brother, uh, about you know, what story to who? And, and and he said, you'll see. Every day, brother George Cherry would come in. Every day he would say, when you get better, you want to tell your story. On the final day of my stay, he said, kid, I expect you're going to tell your story. I said, sure, pal, see ya. I get out of the hospital, uh, and, and a few months later, I go to church with my father, the church I grew up in, the church where Margaret and I would be married. And the priest comes out after the service that I thought was talking directly to me. And he said, Kevin, how would you like to come share your experience about this Good Friday to our seventh and eighth grade class, the very school I went to? And I remember saying to him, Father, I don't have a speech, and I wouldn't know what to say. And my father shoves me forward and says, he'll do it. And I look back like, what are you doing? I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to say. And he said, you'll do it. We need closure. And I'm like, you need closure, old man. I need to go home and lay down. But I, I, I went home and and and, and – the night of the speech, I wrote until 3 in the morning a speech, 17 pages long, 45 minutes, I timed it to read aloud. And I go into the rectory the next morning with these kids sitting uh, cross-laid on the floor uh, in their Catholic uniforms, the same uniform I used to wear. And I'm sitting, I'm standing there holding my cane, leaning on it, dropping page by page to the floor, crying and shaking like a leaf. Um, and I didn't think I made any sense. I didn't think it was going to help anybody. I finished my the last page goes to the floor. Eight hands go up immediately, and there was it was clear I made some kind of an impact. Then I get called to the rectory two weeks later, and I get 120 letters from 120 kids handed to me in an envelope, and six of the kids were actively suicidal, and they wrote about it in their in their in their letter to me because they were not given parameters on what they could write to the, to the speaker. Uh, they were just told to write to their heart's content, and in that we were able to keep them safe. Keep them out of harm's way, and they're alive today. And and so and they're all in college, or some of them, yeah. I think just graduated from college. A lot we still stay in touch with yeah. a lot of these kids. They write Kevin all the time. I mean, some of them have graduated from from university. They're going into the field of psychology and psychiatry. Um, and in in that first presentation, yeah. not knowing cool. not knowing anything about safe messaging or proper messaging, I told my story as it was with the aspect of finding, living, and staying in recovery. And that, that I think, was what turned the tide for these kids. And I think that I didn't, I didn't save their lives, certainly, but they went home and they did the work to change their own lives. They, I was a conduit. To be fair, he shared method, obviously. I mean, it's really hard to get around that one. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a different kind of uh, – I think it's, it's, it's nuanced. It's a nuanced conversation to discuss Kevin's method and, and other methods. But he did share method. He didn't share the graphic – details of the method mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. right and we get we get questions about like well how did you survive and what you know how did you fall and how did you what what position were you in when you hit the water and so and and how do you handle that honey uh, well i i just say that, that I, I i left i left off the Gongi bridge with an attempt to take my life i survived the fall right um a sea lion right here came to my aid <laughs> to keep me alive uh and and the coast guard fished me out of the water Got me to an ambulance, I, I, and I, I talk about my surgery. I talk about my physical recovery, uh, going from a wheelchair to a walker and a back brace to a back brace and a cane, and then right into my first psych ward. And then I go into, in quite de in, in good detail, how I found 
a modicum of wellness. It's recovery. So and, there's and more what, detail in recovery. Yeah, and I talk about I talk about my routine to wellness and how we can all work tirelessly for our better brain health and well-being. And that's I think what motivates people to some people to, to put in the work and, and to, to try to change their lives. And when journalists want to sensationalize the the method or like the details around the method, Kevin, I've always seen him say that's not what's important. You know what's important? And then he goes right into the messaging. And and then it's like this huge, oh my God, like this Pandora's box of, oh, I didn't realize there was all, there were all these like subtopics with suicide prevention. Um, so it's, it's, it's worked for, for our mission. So I'm, so Bart, um, Bart is one of those people that I met um, because I was at a conference. I was speaking. Someone's like, you got to meet Bart Andrews. And, and, and I'm talking to you, um, and I think in, in a way, just I'm thinking of who I was like, you know, five years ago versus who I am today, I'm a little bit naive, like we're gonna talk about hosting a show or talking about content or whatever. And then by the end of that conference, one of the first things I, I speaking events I ever hear from you, you're telling your story for the first time you're coming out as someone who's a suicide attempt survivor. And I'm like, oh. And, and this, and it was a very intense story that you also told. So this is like, these are folks, you know, who tell your stories and, um, and you are also a clinician who understands the research about telling stories. And, and we have done shows with folks talking about different opinions about the research or different ways to kind of think about telling stories. And you've posted some st stuff in the chat. I just feel like you have five comments stored up. I more than five, really. <laughs> um, so, but, but, but first things first, uh, I, I first saw Kevin, we talk about the power of stories. I first saw Kevin speak in Las Vegas at a national council conference. And I want to say it was 2013, Kevin. I, I think it was 2013. I had no idea who Kevin Hines was, no idea. And I was presenting right after Kevin for my own workshop. And um, somebody said, you should go check Kevin out. I'm like, okay. So I'm sitting in the front row and this is right before I got to present, and I'll never forgive you for this, Kevin. Um, I'm bawling as Kevin is telling his story. I mean, everybody around me is bawling as Kevin is telling his story. And it's hard to describe this, but for most of my post-suicide attempt life, I did not identify as a suicide attempt survivor in any way whatsoever. It was a part of me, but not acknowledged. Um, I certainly wasn't going to tell anybody about it, right? I didn't even I didn't even think about it myself, to be honest. It wasn't something that ever really popped up in my life a lot. Uh, I saw Kevin speak, and here was this bright, caring, competent man telling this story in front of, and that was a packed room, man. There had to be a thousand people in that room. It was one of the bigger rooms, and I was like. If he can do that, other people can do that. I can do that, right? And it was really where the first time where one of the things that's so damaging is we associate things like um, psychiatric conditions and suicide with incompetence. Um, and it's incredibly damaging. Um, and it, it really does uh, accelerate the prejudice and discrimination we're all fighting. So Kevin, that was it. After I saw Kevin, I knew I knew that at some point I was going to tell my story, right? It took a while after that, but but I, I realized that I needed to do this. Um, so because there's a lot of us, there's a lot of us out there. And, and many of us don't know anybody else who's open about their attempt history. And that's so incredibly lonely and sad. So I think one of the things that we have, I'll, I'll be blunt, I think, I think safe messaging is at best a nice guide to consider. Um, I think there's things that I will tell you some easy things. We shouldn't cover suicide like crimes. It's Notice that they, they aren't showing, most people aren't showing bodies of COVID victims because it's disrespectful right? But with suicide, we do these really news stories. They run it like a crime instead of a health issue. And I think that's problematic. I think that's bad. But one of the things that's happened is that there's two things going on that, that I think are really important that we talk about. We know that the environment and behavior and culture influences suicide behavior, right? That's just the facts. It's just the way it is. So, um, and we know that there's some level that exposure to suicide can increase the risk. And so you've got well-intentioned people 
who really are trying very hard to prevent future deaths with with safe messaging, right? That's by and large, this isn't. A, it's not an attempt. To, it's not a bad attempt. It's not a. They're not bad actors. There's this really strong belief, and two, this is this is really hard for folks and cultures that have intense stigma and taboo against suicide have much much lower suicide rates and much 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 lower suicide rates, right? Culture has a tremendous influence, I, we're, but we live in an open society. You can't, in an open society like the US, you can't in, in, in enact this intense taboo. It's just, it's just not how open cultures work, right? So folks are trying in some way to kind of create these barriers through messaging. We wanna do things that make it less likely people kill themselves. The problem is that the science doesn't support what they're saying in the way that they think it does. And it leads to some wacky outcomes. For instance, the reason schools don't want to talk about suicide and they shut suicide conversation down is they're afraid that talking about it will lead to more suicides, right? Even though everything we know about suicide is that, in fact, if people were talking about it, we wouldn't have kids that were dead. We would have kids that were talking about suicide and getting help. Right. So what we do is we say we don't want we don't want to talk about this publicly. So that means kids often don't talk to an adult. They don't talk to somebody that can help them. It stays with them. Right. It stays in, in a very small group, which we do know is problematic. Right. So that's a problem. So we've we've tried to put these guardrails up, but the guardrails are arbitrary. They're 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 not evidence based practices. There's there's no evidence that says, hey, Kevin, hey, Bart. Hey, Holly, if you um, stop telling your story, or you tell your story this way, you'll definitely save lives. That, that research doesn't exist out there. there. There's none of that that exists out there. What we have is data that shows that huge um, media stories, large media stories that millions of people read, seem to be associated with an increase in suicide rate. And here's the most my favorite part. The most recent study that came out by the biggest expert in the field said, oh, and by the way, it really only applies to celebrity stories of suicide. It doesn't even really seem to, it doesn't even really seem to have an effect if it's just, we're talking about everyday people, but celeb, it's celebrity suicides. Well, wh which is it folks? We, we, so which is it? So I'll never forget, and this was, it's a painful memory for me. When I first started telling my story, don't talk about your method, don't talk about your method. It's harmful, it's dangerous. And I was on a, a radio show and this young man had, uh, 20s, had shared a story and he talked about his method and the story. And that's a hard thing to do. And it was a courageous thing to do. And after the, after the radio show, I was like, hey, you know, just so you know, it, we don't talk about our, we don't talk about our method. It's not good. And he was crushed, right? He was crushed. So here this person takes this risk tells their story to help other people. And they got somebody like me saying, oh, you know, we don't, we don't do that, it's, it's not good. And, and that, was a, that was a big eye opener for me. So then we gotta ask ourselves, where's the research that says that people like me or Kevin or this young man telling our story about suicide, mentioning our method in any way increases the risk of suicide. Are you ready for the literature based on that, ladies and gentlemen and friends beyond the binary? Zero, a big fat goose egg that says that any of this is impacting anybody in a negative way, right? So I think what you see, and this really connects to some deeper issues we have in our culture. We've pathologized negative emotions, right? We only want to hear that you're doing well, right? I want to hear that, look if somebody had posts a painful post on Facebook. Look how people, some people will chime in, but people will go scrambling away from that. They don't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole, right? Hey, here's a cute picture of my dog. And we're all so happy and the world is great. Oh, you give 100 likes, right? People who are in pain and expressions of pain, we pathologize that. We're all supposed to be happy all the time, right? So stories like CJ's story, like Kevin's story, like my story, remind people that life can be really painful. And we, we don't reinforce people talking about their pain. Well, guess what? We send this message down to our kids, right? We send this message down to our kids. When I talk to youth, one of the, my favorite things to ask them, I was like, okay, if you were at school and you fell on the stairs and hurt your arm more than your arm ever had hurt before, I mean, your arm hurt in a way that you couldn't bear it. How long before you would tell a teacher or go to the nurse? They'd go right away. But there wouldn't even be any hesitation. Now I say, let's say something happened at school that hurt you emotionally. 
in a way that you had never felt before. It was the most painful emotion you ever felt. How many of you would go and talk to somebody and get help for that? Nobody, right? Nobody. So we have normalized this whole thing about that emotional pain is different. We keep that to ourselves. We don't talk about it, right? And it's incredibly, incredibly damaging. There, there's, some, there's, a, there's a great study that looked at two different cultures um, that live in the same area, but speak different languages. So they have the same socioeconomic status, they live in the same places, but they speak different languages. And they wanted to see one of them had a, a higher suicide rate and the other one had a lower suicide rate, a lot lower. And the biggest distinguishing factor in these two groups was that in the one group, Kids said, teenagers said, I would talk to my family if I was having suicide thoughts. I'd be willing to talk to my family if I had suicide thoughts, all right? In the other group, that, that almost didn't exist at all, right? So, so we're sending this message not to talk about this thing. And it's, there's a lot of nuance, even in the research about how media can influence suicide behavior. It's very, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity in it. But instead we go with this really, uh, you can't do this, you can't do that, this is harmful, right? And it's a really big problem. And, and I'm gonna, and I'm just gonna add a, just a little tiny Lego. I, I love it when you, when you talk about this stuff because I have had way more journalists, way more media people ask me what the right way to talk about suicide is so that no one dies. Then I've had clinicians come to me and say, what's an evidence-based practice that will keep my patients alive? And I find that fascinating. Um, Andrea, you're at, you're at Spark Media, right? And you worked on Scattering CJ, correct? Oh, I think you're on mute. Oh, oh, you're still on mute. Still mute. Ah, there we go. Not on my end, it's Ethan, okay. Um, yes, I was the director of so the Tell, tell me a little bit about the challenge of helping to tell the story about CJ and about his mom and his family and the people have been impacted and also like navigate this sort of tri tricky waters about safe messaging. So the easiest part of telling the story really was relating to Hallie and her family because they were incredibly open with us. And right from the outset, we kind of set our own guardrails. Um, I laid down that I had the responsibility and the desire to ask the questions. And she had the responsibility um, to answer how she felt comfortable. So if I asked her, can I film a specific scene? Can I watch her and John getting up in the morning? And John said, absolutely not. Then it's an absolutely not. I knew where um, my kind of guidelines or as Bart said, my guardrails were. And it was never anything that I felt was going to impact the editorial content. It was also more, I think of the Lego building of trust that you have to have when you're spending time with someone, which is very different um, as a filmmaker than as a journalist. And I've been both because a journalist, you kind of swoop in, you get your uh, interview bites, you jump out, you write your story, you cut, that's the, you know, cut that story. And that's the end of the relationship. I think it took us about five years to make Scattering CJ. And so there's a relationship that builds over time. And I think for us, um, we knew from the outset that it was building a relationship with the family that was important. It was um, having transparency with the crew that was important. We had to you know, consistently check in with the crew. How are you feeling? How are you taking in this information? Um, how are you processing this? Are you uncomfortable in any way? Is anything disturbing to you? Because there's so much we don't know about each other. And there's so much that people conceal from each other. Even if you're part of a production crew that's been working for years, there are people that hide things. And so language is so important. And just creating a, an environment of transparency that wasn't just with the Toomeys, but also amongst ourselves. And I thought, you know, it was my first kind of foray into trying to tell a story in the mental health field. And what I found was most difficult was trying to 
relate and um, bring in the mental health experts and practitioners to give us clear guidance. Um, and of course, this is complicated. And of course, there's no axioms necessarily. There's just a few. But I found that there was a lot of contradiction that made it hard for us trying to stay in my lane of telling a story, wanting to be responsible, wanting to be respectful to Hallie and her family, and yet getting a lot of mixed messages from the experts and the practitioners and others that we sought their guidance to try to help us frame our story. Um, and so one of the examples is a clip that we're going to actually see in a little bit. And that was of Hallie's first exa you know, example and, and uh, experience of taking the stage and telling her story through CJ's story, how she was experiencing that journey, where she was on that journey. And her guidance, as we understood it as filmmakers, uh, was to be as open, be as raw, be as honest um, as she could, because this was her opportunity to speak from her heart. This was unscripted in a way, this was her soul crying out. And what transpired, you know, as a filmmaker was something very different. I watched her work on this and sweat it out and, and try to find the words that she felt would adequately express these really deep um, emotions that she felt ready to share. And then when she did, I, you know, with my cameras there, captured it. We thought it was an incredibly powerful, powerful moment both for the people who were in the audience, for Hallie, and for the people that joined her on that stage to bear their souls with her. And yet after we were told, we can't use it. Um, if you use it, we're not gonna screen your film. We're not gonna work with you in the outreach or in the engagement. There were people that were triggered in the audience that left. And I just remember feeling a whole rush of emotions, confused, um, sad, but mostly disappointed for Hallie and for everyone that was on that stage with her because I felt that um, they were misled. And this was, it was such a difficult moment to have that courage to just be raw and vulnerable and then um, the messaging that came back is, no, nah, we don't want you that raw and vulnerable. And so um, I didn't, you know, it was my first experience as I was making this is seeing kind of the, the conflicting, turbulent, sometimes messaging that comes back to us as storytellers. And I was very confused and it was very difficult to navigate because at that time she was also really, um, discouraged, depressed, crushed by it. And being on the sideline and watching someone over this journey who is actually progressing in ways. And then I saw this real kind of flip backwards for a bit. And yet you're a filmmaker and a friend, but you have to also draw those lines. And so it was a very, very difficult experience to watch, to experience, um, and then to try to process together. Now I know Andrea, we're there, we're we're on a schedule, and I admit I've had the kind of week where you've got a better grasp of the schedule than me. But I want to really connect what you've said to what mm -hmm. um, Tara Anna said in the comments because I th think there's there's a point that bears being made here. Tara says, whenever I hear a news reporter or radio DJ use the word committed, I I uh, messenger, I call them, and I explain the why and request the verbiage died by or died from, and is this wrong to do? Here's the thing, Tara Ann. Journalists are professionals and they have standards about how they report on topics. And you're asking for something that is part of journalistic standards for covering suicide. There are reasons that have to do with safe messaging in some respects, but there are also just reasons that have to do with decency and respect and reducing prejudice and discrimination. It is completely all right 
to call a journalist and say, hey, what you did doesn't meet professional standards for how we talk about this. And I think mm -hmm. that's very, very important. I, I feel like that's different than um, th from tone policing someone with lived experience, whether they're a loss survivor, or attempt survivor, or they're impacted friends or family, they're telling a story from their point of view. It becomes very, very tricky. We have some research about method. I think Pata Stuyamoto said, well, what do we know about other cultures? Pata, we know a little. Um, like, for example, I, I was brought in to consult about a suicide that was a really unusual, had a really unusual method. And I said, I don't, I don't think that person's from America, right? And, and they weren't, they were from another country. And the method that was chosen was very um, compatible with Bollywood narratives about suicide method um, and, and um, sort of Bollywood narratives about what would provoke or um, trigger a suicide. And those could be culture reflecting life or life reflecting culture, maybe sort of, I think, I think those are debates the artists and society have had across the ages. But if you're asking, like, do we have great research on that? The answer is, Meh. like, we're all doing our best to understand this. But telling an artist how to tell a story or telling someone with lived experience how to tell their story is really different than expecting a professional to abide by professional guidelines. And I feel like we've, we've turned safe messaging into, like, a dogma. Mm -hmm. uh, my family is very religious. My last little bit of comment and I'll... And I'll send this sort of back into uh, the group. Um, but they're very religious, but from different religions. So we have uh, a Methodist minister and, and, you know, Methodist many generations. We have many Baptist ministers, missionaries, um, and church ladies. And we have very devout Mormons. And I can promise you that everyone in my family doesn't uh, take a sacrament or communion the same way. I don't see baptism the same way. And they are people who will get into conflicts or fights if if uh, if you hit the family dinner just right about the right way to do that. And I'd point out they're all Christians and they believe in taking a communion or a sacrament. They believe in baptism. They believe in <laughs> Jesus Christ. And what's so funny is that they start to get very, very intense about the nuances and, and often miss other parts of that. And I feel like we have these safe messaging conversations. I think Margaret used a great word that was the word effective, where we're not talking about getting more research. I think I um, had a wonderful conversation with Jane Pearson at NIH, NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health. She runs their suicide uh, division. I said, have you done research on what makes telling a story effective from people with lived experience? Because it looks like we're applying journalism guidelines to people with lived experience. I don't think we have like any research on that. We have, mm -hmm. we don't, like that was insane. Um, and I think what happens is we are, are sort of mixing up safe messaging with journalism conventions and we're, we're acting as if there is more research and, and more definitive agreement in our science than there really is. And the confusion is, is when there's, um, this encouragement to be open, to be raw, to be vulnerable. And then when you are, then there's a pullback or no, that's too open or too vulnerable. And I'm not talking about gratuitous. I mean, we all know what's gratuitous, but uh, we also know what's responsible and what is that particular person's lived experience may have something that is a harsh, element to it. I mean, without having to be graphic, but, you know, to divorce, let's say in Hallie's example, that her son took his life in front of them is, this is part of the trauma. This is what she has to bear. This is part of her story. I can't take that out um, and mute that. That is how she suffers and the uniqueness of how she suffers. You do that and it's like redacting a story. You're, you're just um, pulling out the, the very essence of what her experience is and what she and her family have to grapple with. Um, and so this is you know just one of the experiences that I had and that's when I had turned to Anne-Marie and said, I'm confused. I'm a storyteller. This is my first time, as I mentioned, in this 
storytelling realm of you know touching issues of suicide and and mental health but the messaging is confusing as a storyteller the messaging's confusing <laughs> no kidding and and <laughs> couple comments. I think Pata said it really well. This is this this conversation about how to say things is very nuanced. And then Tracy says there are mixed messages about what is right and what is wrong. Um, as if there is one right way or or there is a right way, a wrong way. And I and and I think it's really hard. I think sometimes we have a hard time holding different things in our hands at the same time in our hearts or brains at the same time. There can be multiple effective ways to do this. The things can be very context dependent that we could use some more science to help us understand this. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I also hear when Haley started and, and, sh and she just, I think did a great job of saying, you know, eight, I think it was something like 80% of the time, this is great. And then there are some people that it's not great for. And, both of those things can be true at the same time. P policing Haley when we don't have great science doesn't seem to me like a kind or a gracious thing to do. Yeah. I, I saved that up, Bart. How, how would you share um, really after the weeks and effort and, and your understanding when um, you were enlisted in a sense to share your story. It's This is a different kind of negativity than some of the negativity that you were referencing or, or some of the you know, ways friends may have cut, off, cut you off, this particular example that we're talking about. Um, you know, thankfully there's been a lot of years since then, but the, the truth of it was, it was devastating. Um, it takes, so much courage for people who maybe aren't as willing to speak openly as I am. Um, and even for myself, it was devastating. Um, you know, we, we bought into this platform, um, believing that they really wanted us to share our stories. We had seen footage from other events and we followed the guidelines that they, you know, directed us to follow. And we produced this wonderful show that I was so proud of not just myself, but the other um, people that got up on stage and shared. And, and it was, it wasn't graphic so much as it was raw. It was their, their, their stories and their stories were so important to them that they chose to share them. And that took, for some of those people, it took, I mean, every ounce of strength they had to get up there. And so we did it and we were proud of it and it, it felt profoundly powerful in the moment to be part of a group that's willing to say this is us and and these are our stories and we're sharing it because maybe through our storytelling you will somebody will be impacted and then to be told that you know you can't you can't your stories weren't good enough they weren't um politically correct enough they weren't clean enough is what you know you felt dirty you felt like maybe you did something wrong and we've never been allowed to share that, that event. It's, it was, you know, those people who aren't as public as I have been in, in sharing, you know, CJ's story, they, they just had talked to their friends and their family and said, I'm taking a chance and I'm getting up and I'm sharing my story and it's going to be public and I'm ready for that and I'm proud of it. And then to be told, nope, not only is it not going to be shared, but shame on you for, for saying the words you said. And, I was probably the most graphic in that. And even that I did because, you know, the words I spoke, I, I was very thoughtful about them. They were my story. I, I didn't, it wasn't like I obsessed over the minutia, but to, to have to look at these people and say, you came and you shared and you opened yourself, literally opened yourself to be um, willing to, to, to kind of, you know, it, move forward in your process of healing, whatever your story was. And I'm sorry, this massive organization said, you know, shame on you and we're going to bury it. And there's never really been closure. I actually think for most of the people, it was something they regret doing. And probably, and actually I know one of them has, you know, been in and out of hospitals and struggled and 
to, to have that as a piece of they, they knowingly did it under one expectation of they understood what they were getting into and then to be told it was so wrong is, is something I, I can't even get over. It's been years and I still have such a bad taste in my mouth. Um, I'm not, I'm still proud of what we did. I'm proud of everyone who stood up there. I'm proud of myself for being that raw and open, but you know, in the course of all of this, 10 years of my willingness to share, that was just a horrible experience. And if I didn't have the spine that I have and the willingness to keep going, you know, that could have stopped me dead in my tracks. And that's just, it's a shame. It's a shame that you can be asked to put yourself out there in a way that you're following the rules and then literally have the rug pulled out from underneath you. And I don't think the organization understood the impact really that that decision had when, you know, t no fault of anyone, we did what we were supposed to do. So all these years later, I'm still really mad. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sad, but I'm mad. I'm mad that I asked people to do what they did. And it's just, <clears throat> I won't I'm even sorry. use the, name of the organization. Do you, want, do you want to see what Hallie did? <laughs> We have the next clip actually is her rehearsing it. Way to cue us up. <laughs> yes. That's why she's a producer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I killed my son. One gun, one horrible argument. One eye roll to beat all eye rolls, but it's complicated. His question, you think I'm a failure, don't you? My response, silence. Not a word, not a peep, nothing. Well, Nothing other than that effing eye roll. Failure, I'll show you failure. And he did. Because of me, oh, so complicated. One gunshot to the head. Irreversible damage, no hope gone in a heartbeat because of me, because I failed him in every possible way. It's what I believe, it's what I know, it's what I breathe and smell and hear every moment of every day. His suicide, but my fault so damn complicated. Each morning, guilt. Each evening, more guilt. The pain, so intense, like a never-ending tsunami. Pounding my head, drowning my heart. Devastation coupled with shame and anger, but not at him and not for him. Shame and anger at me, for me. Because I should have, because I could have, because I didn't. Complicated and then some. Tears, so, so many tears. Tears for what I did. Tears for what I didn't. Tears every day since. Some outward, some inward. Tears even when I'm smiling. Therapy? Tried it. Complicated grief. 
it has a name. The dark abyss, the never ending misery, the constant hate I have for myself since. It all has a name. Not sure that makes it better or worse. Not sure knowing why I can't unsee his swollen head, why I can't unhear the thunderous echo of the trigger pull, why I can't unfeel my eyes rolling back in my head as CJ asked me that question. Not sure knowing why my brain is stuck in a constant loop of the worst horror movie ever made helps me understand why I despise myself so much. Not sure of anything anymore. Complicated is difficult. Each day is a challenge to keep moving, to keep going, to keep from following in his footsteps. Each day that I survive feels like a monumental accomplishment. No one knows it's that hard or that bad, but it is. Trust me. Complicated is exhausting. Talking about him, sharing his story, saying his name, exposing the festering wound he left behind, forcing people to listen, opening eyes to the beast that is suicide, changing mindsets about mental illness, what it is and what it isn't. All efforts that keep me functioning, all practices that give me a purpose. To do nothing, not an option. The guilt would eat me alive. It's already taken so much and left behind so very little. It's my constant nemesis and my forever foe. It's a battle I face every day, a battle I'm constantly at risk of losing. I'll keep trying for as long as I can, but who knows, it's complicated. It's hard to want to break the silence after something like that. And I know that people were reacting. I can see that in the chat. Hey, I admit, I admit, I'm a shrink. And so if this is a real shrinky dink question, Haley, like, let me know. How did you feel after you said that? Uh, it's been so many years, but seeing it, um, that's really me. Um, you know, when I say I don't candy coat things, that's what lives in my brain. So, you know, being able to read that out loud, um, in the rehearsal, I think I still felt like it wasn't, you know, a real moment speaking those words in front of, um, this huge audience of, you know, people really focused on me in, in, in that moment. Um, it was scary. Um, you know, I'm constantly thinking that I'm not living up to people's expectations and that I failed CJ. And 
So putting myself out there like that was maybe even more raw than I had been in the past. But if I'm given the opportunity to speak from my heart, that's, that's what it, that's what comes out. So in the moment, I think it, it felt good to get it out there. I think I was Mm -hmm. definitely worried how it would be received. Not, not in, in the way that the organization said we couldn't share it. Not that way. Cause I, I still hear that and think I, I said nothing wrong. The focus of that was not about the method. It was about. And, and let's be clear that we're not here to say that is necessarily like that there's a right and wrong and right. You shouldn't have to do mental gymnastics about like, <laughs> describing yourself. But even in, you know, when I, when I wrote that and I think Andrea had said it, I, I can't not say that. I mean, You know, when Kevin says Kevin couldn't share a story without saying he jumped off a bridge. I mean, that that is what it is. Um, My son shot himself. There's, you know, have I ever truly talked about the what we saw and the true graphics? No. Um, But do I say, you know, the things about he did it in front of us and, you know, he tumbled into my husband's arms after there's no getting around that. That's my reality. Um, And if you if you told me I couldn't share those details, then I wouldn't want to continue to talk because it is, it is a piece and it's a piece that people need to understand. This is suicide. This is what this means. It's not pretty. It's not pleasant. It's not, um, it's, it's just the worst thing. And I just, it's so hard to think that people don't feel safe and comfortable speaking their truth. And, you know, the, the conversations, the, the discussions are what's going to get through to people. I, I just inherently believe that. So in that moment, being part of that, that event, um, I think it was very appropriate. I, I, I still believe I'm a better person for having shared it, but it's still hard for me to watch. And I, I said it, <laughs> it's so sad. It's so vulnerable and raw and, um, but it's real. And I will never be accused of being dishonest about this journey and hating every second of it. And, you know, it's 10 years later and I'm going to cry, which <laughs> I just don't want to be in this, this, I don't want this to be part of my journey. And it's, it is, and it's the only way I can honor my son is to be honest about the loss, his loss and how impact, what an impact it had on me. Um, CJ suicide did not make me a better person. There's no getting around that. And I'm not going to lie about that. So I, I know that touched some people. I know it received some some people focus solely on the fact that I mentioned how he ended his life and that was the end of it for them. And um, I don't feel sorry for them for that because that's, you know, perception is what's what's important. People understand what they want to understand, but I'm sorry that they couldn't see beyond that because I'm just one mother, but I'm one mother who hates everything about where I am. And, um, Oh, I wish I could come to the screen and give you a hug. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Be- because I have a kid who, can, well, both of my nuts are initials. I have a kid who's a CJ. This is, this is um, I don't know. This is really ripping me up. Uh, I'm yeah, so I think one of the things that's, it's incredible to me that we're in a place in our culture where people are so uncomfortable of certain truths that they would just rather shut people down. Um, and then they use the, they use the trope that it's unsafe. Mm-hmm. It's unsafe. What a load of crap. So I think one of the things that's really incredibly powerful is that there's uh, there are certain stories we're allowed to tell and there's certain stories that you're not supposed to tell, right? And Hallie, you're telling a story that's a true story that that other people have had similar experiences but 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 there's not a happy ending Hallie where's the happy ending to our story here so you don't have a happy ending why 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 do you get to tell a story without a happy ending and it's it is 
absolutely stunning to me that the number of people who have lost a loved one to suicide and life doesn't go on for them in the same way ever again, and they never get over it, and they feel guilty, and they have shame around it. That's painful enough than to have other people say, you can't tell your story, right? You're, you're not allowed to be this way, right? You can't, right? It, it is so, it's so incredible. I mean, we're, what we see here is the Dolores umbrification of culture, right? Um, where basically, yeah, and, and if I, Dolores Umbridge, I still get, when I watch the movie, I still get really angry at Dolores Umbridge. So there is this kind of nasty school marm. Um, you're, we're gonna tell you what to think and what to say. Um, and if, and you're going to feel ashamed of things that you shouldn't feel ashamed about, right? It's it's an absolutely incredible to me. So I think one of the things that's really powerful about your story, Hallie, is that it's a human experience that many other people have, but they feel like they're alone in that experience because they don't know how to talk about it. And the incredible courage it takes to tell this story that doesn't have this wonderful happy ending. Um, because there's lots of us that don't have happy endings. Mm -hmm. so, and I think this is where we really get to, this is where the, the, the moral panic comes uh, around this. Oh, shut it down, shut it down, because people feel unsafe. Here's who safe messaging is for, are you ready for this? It's so the people who are shoving safe messaging down their throats feel safer. It's not for, it's not for anybody else to be safe. They just want to feel safe because if they can shut you down or shut me down, um, then, oh, I feel a little better inside, don't I? Right? Can, I, it, can I talk about Kevin's story? Just there was a piece yeah. where he talks about his method and he tells the story of attempting to kill himself that, that I think about all the time. And I remember even thinking about this yesterday in an unrelated way. Um, I, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Kevin. So I've heard you. I've heard you do this several times, and and I've heard you tell the story several times. And there's there's a piece where sort of time stands still when you talk about this, and it you talk about letting go, and sort of hanging there in the air, and that time sort of stops for a moment, and you 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 have an insight that everything in my life is fixable except for the fact that I just let go. And, and I have to tell you, like that's, in my mind, that's, that's, the, that's the theme of the story that you're telling. And it's what I remember every time you tell the story. It's like what I hear in my head when I think about that. I hear your voice saying that part of your story every time. I don't know if I've ever told you that. And it, it's like the thing that I, that I think, I wish I could plant this in other people's brains because this is the thought that people have. But you can't have that story. You can't have that narrative. And you can't have that line or that sort of important universal truth if you don't tell the method and right. you don't tell the whole story. It's at the millisecond that my hands left the rail. I had an instantaneous regret for my actions and the 100% recognition that I just made the greatest mistake of my life but I thought it was too late. And for 98% of the people that jumped off that bridge, it was too late in, in, yeah. in the last 84 years of it being opened. And then to come and find out that the very, that, that of the 26 remaining Golden Gate Bridge jump survivors who are alive today, many have died of natural causes or old age, of the 26 that remain alive today, 19 have come forward to say they had the same instant regret that I had. And that's the majority of those who, who came forward, the, the majority of those that exist in, in, in that are living today. And then to find out even further that people that have survived methods all over the world of all Collective means group, collectively uh, have come, ours, come, forward, and come forward and said that they, not, not all of them, not everyone, but certainly a great number of them have come forward to say There's just one that they all had is to regret. <laughs> yep. And, and, and it's, it, and I know why, and I know, I, I can tell you exactly in my mind why that is because they recognized in that moment that they thought it was too late that their thoughts did not have to become their actions. Their thoughts did not have to own, rule, or define what they did next. But for all of those we've lost, it's too late. It's too late. Now. And so to, to express that, I can't leave out the bridge jump in the first place, or else I'm doing the story a huge disservice, and I'm not teaching the people I'm, I'm educating with my story how to survive immeasurable pain. 
And I think you're also telling a very important, with a story, a very important fact, a scientific fact we know, that we know that people who attempt suicide and who die by suicide, we, we have great data that almost all of them are ambivalent, that part of them wants to live, part of them wants to die. And for, I want to say it's about, it's like 94 to 97%, I can't remember the exact number in my head, of folks who survive very serious, nearly lethal suicide attempts, that they're glad they survived, that they had that same realization. But it is awfully hard to correct a public perception that like pe there's a myth that when people take their lives that they wanted to do it, it was inevitable and you can't stop them. And what you and when you tell your story and the way you tell your story is an incredibly powerful narrative about this is what people who are attempting suicide think. And so you should know I was ambivalent. You should know I immediately wanted to live. Yeah. You should know that. And I think you, you can't, it, it's like you can't just pull out that scientific fact and have it stick with people as powerfully as the story. I read mm -hmm. the science long before I'd heard your story. Your story is what sticks in my head. It's right. the neuroscience of storytelling. Yes. The sticky memories that it creates, the viscerality that you actually uh, is developed. Um, and that's a story, that's their science behind that. Um, go ahead. You know, in, in, that, in, that, in that moment, you know, in the moment where it was either life or death, um, I came to a point as I was falling, all I did was pray that I would live. Uh, and having survived that fall uh, and, and, and get, getting to live 20 years past the day I should have died by all accounts, um, finding, finding the deepest level of gratitude that I've ever experienced every moment, every day, I don't take anything for granted, any one for granted, or any place for granted anymore. I appreciate every single thing in this life, and it, it, it's to the tenth degree. And I think that you know, when when we when we when we look at people who discuss method, um, and then and who who didn't have a surviving story, triumph over adversity. Well, I think I think I think Haley, you're being judged by the world who sees the story and sees. Like Bart said, it's it's not a happy ending. It's not you can't say it. I think that's nonsense. You you lived your truth. Your son lived his, and you need to be free to tell whoever you want to what happened when when it happened. And I, I, I'm grateful to be on this panel with you because your perspective 110 percent matters. And Andrea, I'm so glad you made that movie with her because Scattering CJ uh, has changed and saved lives. Um, you know, if it and, saves one life, it would have been worth it. it did, how it many? It already so much has. more. And, and, and I think we need to respect you, Haley, and all you've gone through enough to say it's your story. You get to tell it how you want. There's also another thing I want to bring up that's really important. I think about about Kevin's story and about many other stories out there. And I think this is in particular. Um, something I really want to share with you, Holly. There's the, the in addition to what April had mentioned, um, the instant regret. There's also the healing piece, or we get a lot of comments from parents that say whose children have passed away from suicide, and they blame themselves, and it's my fault, and it's my fault. And Kevin, um, you know, what do you tell people, honey? Uh, you know, I and, and watching that video of you saying it's my fault that that hurt me to my core. My father. You know, when when he, he says in the film, he says, Kevin, every time, when I said, Dad, do you still fear my death by suicide? He said, every time the phone rings. He didn't say when I call him. When the phone buzzes in his pocket, his first and every thought, is my son Kevin alive? And I did that. I, I created that reaction in him. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think that I lost my train There's no, There is no blame. There's no blame. There's no all, guilt to be had. It, it, it doesn't belong to you. He didn't die because of you or in spite of you. He died because of lethal emotional pain that likely had nothing to do with you. That moment you shared, where you you, you said um, you said that you didn't respond to his, you think I'm a failure. That was not the impetus to his suicide. He was hurting so deeply before that it led to his death. And I think that um, the thing about about suicide and suicidal ideation is, and, and, and uh, Dr. Foreman. April, I, I, I think you said you said the word want, and I think that's a mistake people make. If we're going to talk about language as opposed to just safe messaging and, and effective messaging, but let's go into language. 
I don't think people find themselves, and I know people say it, but I, I never wanted to dab in my hands. I believed I had no other course of action to take. I believed there was no other option besides dying by lethal emotional pain. you wanted pain. the pain to stop. I wanted the pain to stop. And the pain is so overwhelming, so overbearing. What is the one thing you want to happen when you find yourself in excruciating physical pain? Stop, go away, or end. Brain pain is 300,000 times worse than any physical pain I've ever experienced. And I promise you, my friends, I have experienced tremendous physical pain in my life on more than one occasion. And many people are. There's some people on the chat that are um, experiencing brain pain. It's real. And for those of you on the chat that are going through hell right now, you are beautiful just as you are. You are intended to be here until your natural end. And suicide never has to be the solution to your problem because we know it is the problem. So I'm going to help us wrap up with final thoughts because I know that we're a little late and we have one more clip, correct? Two. Two. Okay. So I'm going I'm <laughs> to I think that Kevin's done a beautiful final thought for people in pain. Um, and, and I'm going to, and I'm going to go in the order that I think makes some sense. Uh, Andrea, as you're looking at how um, people like Bart or Kevin or Margaret or Haley tell their stories. And as a person who tried to help people tell their stories and you're reading these chats, do you have a final thought? This is the speed messaging, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> listening to Bart, listening to Kevin, Margaret uh, also has a story, and Hallie, and all of us have stories. I think that my quick message would be is that I hope their courage and their ability to come forth and uh, you know show their vulnerabilities will encourage other people. Uh, that's, I really do believe in the essence of storytelling and the storytelling that allows you to reframe your stories when you share those stories. And I do believe uh, that it helps the storyteller as it helps the listener. It helps all of us. And I think it just gives a validation to us uh, that as Kevin said, we are not alone and all of us are suffering. And the more we can see our own stories and other people's stories, the more we show the empathy and compassion for others as we show for ourselves. And that's really um, where, I, where I land in this. But I just have so much respect for this collective heartbeat that all of you have created here and just feel um, very humbled. I've always had that feeling and honored to just be able to tell the story. Bart, final thoughts. Yeah, I've already I already posted this. We we don't build hope by denying the truth. We, that's just not the way that any of this works. Uh, it, it's incredibly important that people understand that everyone grieves differently. People don't get to tell you how to grieve. That that's not how any of this works. And people don't get to tell us how we tell our stories. They're our stories. We get to tell our stories the way we want to tell our stories. And if you don't like it, bug off, right? Um, I, I think that my patience for this sort of thing um, from the moral scolds out there is zero. So, um, and I think it's really important that if we don't stand up to bullies and there's bullying involved, people don't understand this is a bullying behavior. A lot of the things that you see around this issue is bullying type behavior. You got to stand up to bullies. Mm -hmm. um, and Hallie, thank you for telling your story. It is heart wrenching. It's painful. It's beautiful. Uh, and I just am honored to, to be able to hear you talk about it. So thank you. Thank you. Holly, tell your story or tell your final <laughs> thought. Um, again, I'm just, I'm honored to once again, have an opportunity to be a part of a, a conversation with such an esteemed panel that really all believe that the storytelling is what's important. And I appreciate that, um, April, you said in the beginning, we may not all agree with the you know, the ways and how we talk about it, but the talking is what's important. Um, I am not a religious, I'm not spiritual. I'm such a concrete person. I don't believe I'm gonna see my son after, which makes me very sad. But what I do feel compelled is that I absolutely, want to at some point in the future spend some time with Kevin and Margaret. I feel like people have come into my life and I don't understand why because I I don't believe in fate and those things, but very, very rarely have people, have I felt so compelled to want to work with people and even just to sit and spend some time talking to you both. Um, 
it's been a pleasure to even just have this little bit, but I truly hope at some point I can, you know, be with you and learn from you. And I don't know, I'm not a stalker, but I feel. I feel the same way. So can... I like that as your final thought, Emma, not a stalker. <laughs> I just, I've, been, I've been really lucky in this, this most tragic 10 years to meet a few people. I've met many, many people who are all wonderful, but some, there's got to be, you know, that God wink, which I'm not even going to go into that I don't believe in God, but some something that says this is the, this, these are the people that you need to have in your life. And um, so that's going to be my, you know, my 2021 goal is to try to figure out how to make that happen because I, yeah. I just yeah. see. I've seen the movie and CJ's ashes have been scattered where you jumped. And I, I just feel a connection and I'm, I'm almost having a hard time speaking to how strong I feel about that. So I hope you will accept I'm not a stalker and that I really do want to be both and find a way to work together on some level. I would be we'll work together. We'll figure this out. It was really fun. We'll There's have. plenty of work yeah. to go around. I'm, I'm going to get to the clip, Andrea, I swear. So final thoughts <laughs> are when it comes to storytelling, we deserve all the rigor and all the scrutiny that, that data and science have to offer us. And we deserve all the tolerance and the acceptance and embracing of other people that spirituality has to teach us. Andrea, get us to a clip. <laughs> <laughs> go in. Do you want to tee this up or we're just going to go right into it? Yeah, we we'll want to. I think it's your clip. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's our clip. Is this the number five one? Okay, so this, yes. is, this, I is, think this is Dr. John Draper. Yes. Who coined the phrase lethal emotional pain, who is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Director. This is him and his opinion on mm -hmm. methodology and speaking about it in public. There's, there's this thing called the Papageno effect. I know you know what that is. A lot of people don't know what that is. The Papageno effect is, is the opposite of what's called the Werther effect. The Werther effect is, 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 was really based on this, the character of the sufferings of King Werther. This was a, a book that was published you know, in, the, in the 18th century about this uh, uh, France of this young, this young suffering and who, who killed himself. He was a writer who killed himself. And that, and that, that, that led other people as kind of a contagion of hopelessness that where people said, well, if Werther would kill himself and feeling so miserable, then, then maybe I should too. Then there's this thing called the Papageno effect, which was basically based on this, it's a, uh, in, in Mozart's magic flu. There's a character named Papagino, who is 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 at the end of it. He's 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 so mourning the loss of his wife and who died, and he believes that he there's more hope for him. And then comes along uh, the, these, these visions of his children who are saying to him, "Hold on, hold on," um, and 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 said, "We love you. We want you to. You, you need to stay alive." And then suddenly a vision of his his wife comes along and says, I'm still here for you. And suddenly he feels a great deal of hope. And the Papageno effect was that when back when they, when this Mozart's magic flute was shown, people would walk out of the theater feeling, Papageno made me feel so good, so hopeful, and it created this contagion of hope. Well, what we have found is that this thing called the Papageno effect, the contagion of hope, has been coined by an Austrian researcher who's found that stories of hope and recovery, such as yours, when they are gotten out into the public and people see those, it actually reduces the suicide rate. People begin to, to believe that, that if Kevin can get through this, I can too. And, and this Papageno effect is, can only happen through the mass media. Kevin, you used to go around and you still go around so beautifully telling people about your story. It makes has such an impact. But when we can actually have it on film, it can have this force multiplier effect where people can be touched all over the world in places that you will never be able to reach if you tried to in your lifetime. So to us, 
that is what a ripple effect is, is that as you drop this film into the ether, so to speak, it's gonna have a ripple effect across people, families, communities, and cultures worldwide. And I'm excited to be a part of it, sir. There is zero evidence out there, anywhere, that says that a story about, that features as part of it, the method of suicide and, and the way in which a person attempted in the context of a story of hope and recovery and how a person got through that and beyond that and went on to live a life worth living. There is zero evidence that that has any negative, disadvantageous iatrogenic effects, none. Because when people watch this film and hear those stories, they're not focused on the attempt. What they're focused on is, wow, they were really serious, they wanted to die, and now they really want to live. And when, they, when people leave this theater, after seeing this movie, they're not gonna be thinking and talking all about Kevin's attempt so much as they're gonna be talking about Kevin and the life he is living and the lives he's inspiring with the life that he leads. I gotta go in the basement. Hi, Johns. Do you have any idea where our tape is? I also need a picture of CJ, John. And I need, oh, I need scattering CJ bracelets. Every day is a gift. I forget that sometimes. And I think we need to be reminded that life can be ugly and messy and, and we don't all get the happy ending. I just keep going every day, and some days are good, some days are bad. I just hope that somebody will hear us, and then, you know, maybe we'll change somebody's outcome. Look how beautiful it is. I was so lost. I just wanted my son to be remembered. I can't help but think that if you watch our struggle, if it makes you a little bit more aware, if you learn about CJ and you walk away from that intent on making a difference, being kinder than you might have been, being more open to those that are struggling around you, that's huge. <laughs> With CJ, I really think it was just a really poor, snap decision. There are times where people just don't feel like there's any other way out. There are other ways out. There are other things that you can do. There are people who are willing to help. I am not on a one-woman mission to raise awareness about suicide, but it is part of our reality. And it shouldn't be something that's forbidden to speak about. If all of this can help even one person realize, hey, I'm not weak for asking for help. I'm not a failure because I can't do this on my own. If even one person is still alive today because of this, it's awesome. Our final guest speaker tonight is Hallie Twomey. Hallie has no idea how many lives she has touched and at times probably saved as she continues to openly share her story. Each day that I survive, talking about him, sharing his story, forcing people to listen, opening eyes to the beast that is suicide. It's a battle I face every day changing mindsets about mental illness, what it is and what it isn't. All efforts that help keep me functioning, all practices that give me a purpose. To do nothing, not an option.
I was pulling my eyes out. <laughs> so close. Yeah. So close. Keep fighting. You're, I have to every day. You are a powerful voice. Oh, Connor, you're leaving, right? Yeah. I gotta give you a hug. <laughs> so I'm gonna hang out, you know. Frank was really Thank nice. Thank you so much. I love you, love you, love you. They're really good today. Thank you. All right. I don't say goodbye to Connor without telling Connor I love him. You aren't promised a second chance, so you better make sure that you tell your family you love them. Life is short, and you don't know what's promised for tomorrow.